are ourselves, in our view, part of the consumer movement. The Free Market Foundation's position on issues is always consumer-centered. Uh, you will be getting a free handout for those that want of our submission, for example, on the demarcation regulations, that is the regulation separating medical and health insurance from, uh, from medical schemes and basically forbidding and banning health insurance at all. You, you may not have uh, health insurance as a competitor. I'm going to have a bit to say about that. But you'll see that our concern is not about the rights of insurers or the rights of people selling products, whether it's sugar, salt, tobacco, liquor, uh, or the rights of, of, of suppliers. Generally, our concern is the rights of consumers and the extent to which consumer rights and an important variable for us, consumer dignity, uh, are compromised. So I'm going to cover a wide range. I can't, I'm not going to, in my formal presentation, dig down into any aspect in great detail, with the possible exception of tobacco, simply because it's the one that led the charge. It's the first issue that came under scrutiny. And when we, many years ago, in the foundation, were concerned about it, we were, uh, well, nobody accepted or understood what to us was the principle. It had nothing to do with tobacco. In fact, as I'm going to emphasize, tobacco is not regulated, tobacco is not taxed, only people are regulated and people are taxed. And so our concern is the, is the rights of people. So uh, that, that then was the thin edge of the wedge as we expected and predicted, and that has now snowballed into a very wide range of regulations and controls, culminating, for example, maybe not culminating, but along the way, one of the dominoes in some countries, such as recently North Korea, is compulsory exercise. And once uh, you allow Big Brother to take control of your personal lifestyle and health uh, at all, then there is no principle by which you can stop it. For example, saying you have to have compulsory exercise or you may not have unprotected sex. There is no then a principled limit to what Big Brother can step into in controlling your personal life. So we're going to run through very rapidly some aspects of the regulated consumer. And my scheme will be to discuss the principles, uh, uh, basic rights of consumers, the nanny state cost benefits, trade-offs, unintended consequences, implications for freedom, dignity, and satisfaction, and uh, then some specifics regarding health and safety and some specifics regarding such issues as finance, gambling, and maybe some general aspects because it goes much further. Uh, some people would argue, for example, the compulsory seatbelt law is also a consumer law, and everyone would think that, yes, it promotes sa road safety. That's just because they don't know the data, the facts statistically, objectively, including from our own road, road safety council are that where seatbelts are made compulsory, casualties and fatalities rise, and the reason simply is consumed drivers feel less safe and therefore drive less cautiously, so collision rates go up. Very simple economics, as every economist like Darby wrote knows, if you lower the price of something, you increase consumption. So if you lower the price of driving badly and dangerously, you should predict more dangerous and bad driving. That is what an economist predicts and what in fact happens, as has been shown by all of the available data. So uh, I will just discuss maybe at the end some of the general <coughs> aspects. So um, the puritanical mindset seems to inform uh, this regulation of consumers. Uh, sin tax is uh, health and satisfaction tax. I'm going to point out why that is. Again, an economist will immediately understand that if you raise the price of something, for example, something you don't want people to consume, sugar, salt, fat, whatever, there have been fat taxes in some countries, for example, uh, then what you get less buying of is not the thing that has inelasticity of demand, but things that have elastic demand. In other words, people will spend more on what they want and less on something that supposedly they should be having. And one of the highly elastic things that people consume, I will try and dig somewhat into this, is strangely enough health care, which we know because when people have medical cover, their health care costs multiply many fold, they skyrocket. And vegetables, which we know because when the price of potatoes goes up, they sell less and tomatoes sell more. So we know that healthy things, particularly vegetables and health care, have highly elastic demand. 
And so the extra revenue collected, for example, on liquor, when you have liquor tax, gambling tax, is actually revenue money diverted from spending on healthcare and vegetables, for example, uh, anything that is elastic in demand. So we have some data and statistics. Uh, there's a paper out there of a paper I presented to the African Tax Forum in Arusha uh, two weeks ago, which is basically the heads and uh, people from departments of finance from African countries, uh, including some very senior officials, DGs and so on. And uh, I went into that over there. And there was basically unanimity, interestingly. There was no debate about my proposition that fiscal measures aimed at a particular product, or as I point out, a consumer of that product. You don't actually ever tax a product, you tax a consumer. Uh, comes at the expense of things that are supposedly considered more desirable, exercise, education, clothing, housing, healthcare, and so on. So one of the things that's interesting is that I call it puritanical for a good reason, uh, which is that never ever mentioned in the discourse on what should be regulated, whether it is your right to buy health insurance or whether it is your right to, to drink with your buddies or whatever it might be, never mentioned, uh, breathtaking silence, is freedom, pleasure, satisfaction, happiness, they are presumed to be of zero value. And my own personal subjective view is that they are of maximum value. They are the most valuable things there are, which is human satisfaction and pleasure, and they are dismissed as if they have no relevance or value, whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm going that is going to be a theme I'll address. Uh, let me just immediately say, as I mentioned some of these, we're very familiar with the fact that the organized consumers, Tommy will comment later, we've had lengthy discussions and we know that the, the Consumer Union, Consumer Forum and Consumer Fair, uh, we don't necessarily agree, but that's fine. We've agreed, as Tommy will explain, to work on areas in which we do agree. Uh, our position is somewhat more radical, which people like Tommy and Lilibet Mulman at the back are very thankful for because it makes them look moderate. Um, so uh, our position is, is quite uh, rigid and I, we, for example, consider choice and satisfaction as very, very high values. And it is interesting that in the public discourse, for example, I believe there was a debate on TV this morning regarding plain packaging. As far as I know, there was no mention made whatsoever about whether consumers should be allowed to have pretty products, attractive products, colorful, desirable products. That is, it never comes into it. It's never as if the consumer simply should be told what sort of packaging they're going to get, whether they like it or not. Um, so we'll look at some of these things. Some basic consumer rights, in our view, 10, nice round number. These are not quite the same as you have in various consumer movements, but pretty similar. And anyone from the consumer movement or consumer journalist will be immediately familiar with almost all of these. But in, in my view, they are the right to choice. That's a first consumer right. The right to information through, for example, advertising, labeling, education, public, you know, government uh, information and so on, lab, but, but inform, important sources of information are advertising, marketing, lab, marketing, labeling, and for example, display, to be able to literally pick up and look at and handle the product. I remember when I went to the communist countries, as I did because I was in the uh, struggle myself and various reasons why I went there during the communist era, um, what struck me was that when you went shopping, for example, in East Berlin or in, 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 in Moscow or whatever, consumers could not actually physically reach the products. You stood behind a counter and you pointed to what you wanted and that was not actually handed to you. You then got a chip, you went and paid, you went outside, you went to a window and the thing was handled to you. But you couldn't physically handle products. You could point to them uh, and they were on display at a distance. Now that, of course, uh, has changed, and for consumers in capitalistic economies, that would be an extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, but that is how it was, where consumers couldn't literally physically handle a product to make decisions and get a feeling for them and get information. And it's a very subjective thing. No two items of clothing in this room are the same. I'm willing to wage money on it. We don't need to check your underwear for what it's worth, but we can check everything else. And the reason is because no two consumers agree about what the optimum buy is. This lady was unique in this room, was thinking that that beautiful red jacket she's wearing was the best value for money. No one else in this room thought that. So that is what 
And I bet she handled it, tried it on, looked at it, and that is an important consumer right, which is often forgotten. Um, so warnings, people are entitled to no risks, and we feel very strongly about that, by the way. We uh, free market people feel very strongly that uh, risks should be communicated. It's an it's a absolute right of consumers to know what they are. There's, in fact, even a law called Potier's Rule, uh, which says that where someone who's a regular supplier of a product sells someone, they are uh, something they are absolutely obligated at common law. You don't need regulations or consumer protection acts for this to communicate those risks and, and defects to, to buyers. It's a, it's a fundamental law that has been around for thousands of years, that, that sellers have to inform buyers of, of faults and risks. Um, uh, attractive packaging and display. This is interesting, and in my view again is this is a fundamental consumer right, to, to, be, to enjoy shopping. If consumers don't enjoy it, they can buy everything in warehouses. Why do they go to shops and shopping centers? Why is the Killarney Mall just been refurbished for a billion rand. It's merely so that consumers could have the psychological experience of thinking it's lacquer, of just liking to be there. Uh, and this is an extraordinary amount that consumers are willing to pay for that experience. It often fascinates me how much consumers are willing to pay just to have a congenial and pleasant and attractive experience when they go shopping and doing their buying. Um, uh, free competition and innovation. Consumers are entitled to people competing for their brand, for their custom. The market is a permanent democracy, a consumer democracy, where consumers vote uh, with every rand they spend for what should be supplied. It's the most powerful democracy. It is a democracy that co goes on continuously, not only every five years, and literally with every rand that is spent and every rand that is not spent. So every time a consumer walks past a product or a service and doesn't buy it, the consumer is in fact casting a vote against it. And, and that is a fundamental consumer right. Uh, consumers are entitled to fund sponsorships and law, from lawful enterprises. Interestingly, uh, there's a, a rapid <coughs> close down around the world of what, who may fund the consumer movement, for example, to whom they may go to get sponsorships. This has implications far beyond just consumers. It has implications for the media, people sitting in this room, journalists, advertising, marketing, sport, sponsorships, recreation, you know, sending uh, to sports teams for, for obscure sports to foreign countries, whatever it might be. And the cons consumers and everyone else have the right to, to access those funds. Then is uh, consumers have the right to be given education advice and be persuaded. That is a perfectly legitimate thing to do with consumers. Don't do this, do do that. Uh, you know, take homeopathic treatments, don't take homeopathic treatments. Every consumer should be free to get information on it and to make their own decision. And those of you who don't know, I might say more on this, that basically when you walk down Dischem or, or Clicks shelves and you see rows and rows and rows of supplements and alternative healthcare products, CAMs, complementary and alternative medical products, uh, you might not know this, but as of November last year, virtually all of them were banned. They all now have to go through precisely the same healthcare checks as regular allopathic medicines, and virtually none have done that, and no health claim can be made for any product or service unless it has been approved by the Medical Control Council. And next in line is, of course, traditional healers, who for the time being are exempt, but they too will be in due course banned from being able to say that what they do is healing. Uh, and no account is made of, for example, placebo effects and the fact that people just like to take homeopathic treatments. That's their choice even if the scientists say they have no effect, whatever. So we stand by the right of consumers to make that decision and not the right of the nanny state to tell them. So uh, we believe in empowerment, dignity, and respect, which, by the way, is the very first clause in our constitution. People are entitled to, res to, to their human dignity. That is not in the Bill of Rights. And one must understand the Bill of Rights is subject to the limitation clause. Section 1 is not. Section 1 is absolute. And anything that violates the dignity of consumers is, should be regarded as unconstitutional, including, for example, uh, forbidding them the right to have freedom of association with their friends, uh, to congregate freely. You know, there's a, strangely now with the ban on indoor smoking, if you work alone in your own factory, you are the only person there. Uh, it is forbidden for you to smoke when you are indoors. 
uh, so the law becomes uh, increasingly, frankly, crazy. Um, and uh, and, uh, and uh, that I'm going to elaborate if time permits, is that so-called private public places used to be called private places. Uh, there's a strange thing now with tobacco, which I find bizarre because I'm a lifelong non-smoker and I actually hate tobacco smoke, that I used to be protected by people being forced into smoke-free ventilated areas and buildings. Now they are forced out into the pavements, onto the pavements. So big buildings, hundreds of people congregate and I have to walk through their cloud of smoke. Uh, and so they are forced ironically and perversely from a private place, a building, into a public place a sidewalk. So we actually are banning smoking in private places, not in public places, and we are allowing it in public places. And uh, so those of us who are non-smokers are victims. Um, so uh, we want information cho and choices regarding trade-offs. In other words, consumers are entitled to know what the risks and benefits are, and then they must make their own choice. Uh, the risk of you know, getting cirrhosis of the liver is so much if you drink so much. Uh, but it's your choice, we're going to let you know, we're going to warn you, we're going to have uh, uh, alcoholic information available for you and so on, but in the end it has to be the consumer's right to decide on their own trade-offs between life and, and risks. Uh, then ex consumers have a right to accessibility, product range and payment options. The payment options I throw in there because it's another big area, is what kinds of agreements may one enter into, the limits of agreements and so on. Uh, so um, these are consumer rights that are under scrutiny and, and currently uh, under violation in many ways. So these rights are always subject to, and I want to make this clear because there's a lot of confusion about this, so let's get this out the way, and I want you to remember this throughout what follows from Tommy and from me. Third party protection, none of this says that the rights of third parties need in any way to be compromised. Let me give you obvious examples that uh, passive second-hand tobacco smoke is a third-party right. In other words, a consumer right, the right not to be subjected to somebody else's tobacco. That must be absolute and vigorously defended. We, we are for uncompromising. People talk about trade-offs and balance between rights. No, no, we don't accept trade-offs at all. Uh, uh, you know, it's like saying there must be a balance regarding rape and sex. You know, we need trade-offs. So rape is okay on Thursdays, but not the rest of the week. No, it's absolute. You have the absolute right to have sex, and you have the absolute right never to be raped. These are not compromised. There's no middle ground. There's no trade-off. There's no gray area. They are absolute. And so it should be regarding the protection of third parties, which includes, for example, protection from drunk drivers or protection from uh, drunk people being abusive and assaulting you in a pub or a restaurant or at a club. So never in doubt is the right to educate and persuade. Um, so which consumers are affected? Firstly, the poor, very important, that almost all of the measures victimize the poor disproportionately. The poor are most in need of protection and paradoxically are most harmed by controls and taxes. Uh, this is a very, very important issue, is that the rich and elites, and by rich and elites I mean people in this room, uh, are pretty much unaffected by any of these controls and regulations we discussed. The, the, the real people affected are the masses out there, the folk dog beta. Uh, they are the ones who don't have the sophistication, don't have the facilities, whatever. Let me just give you one practical example again, if I can use tobacco, because it lends itself to this very nicely. I'm not discussing specifically tobacco. But the proposed law is that there should be no smoking within 10 meters of an entrance. Uh, interestingly, it doesn't say an exit. I don't know whether you can smoke at exits, but not entrances. That aside, uh, 10 meters of an entrance. Now, this, this presupposes elites, rich people. It presupposes entrances that have 20 meters between them. In other words, you can stand in the middle. But it is impossible in a low income or a high density area. You cannot get 10 meters from an entrance. Uh, so this is how the poor would be victimized by it. If you live in Alex or you live in Mashingu village or you live in, in Ivory Park where my retired housekeeper lives, you would actually literally have to walk out of the township or location or area or suburb where you live in order to find somewhere where you would lawfully be allowed to smoke. You would not be allowed to smoke anywhere in, in there because everything would be within 10 meters of an entrance. So the poor are the victims. The poor are more easily cheated, 
the poor pay more tax because they consume more sin. In other words, the highest ratio of consumption, liquor, tobacco, gambling, uh, sugar, uh, refined wheat, salt, uh, is amongst the poor. The poor are the people who consume more, and therefore when you uh, add taxes and controls to those products, what you're doing is victimizing the poor. I'm going to skip over it when it comes and mention it now, but immediately, for example, an economist will be familiar with the regressive tax. The fact is that if you have the same tax on the same product, liquor bottle, a bottle of beer, for example, uh, then the poor are taxed more in the sense that for every poor person, one rand has a higher relative value. Uh, and for a rich person, it's immaterial. It makes no difference what the tax is on liquor. But for a poor person, it's very substantial. And for the poor person to buy their liquor, they have to sacrifice a great deal of other stuff, food, uh, uh, clothing, housing, education for their children, health care. That is the penalty the poor pay for the same tax on a bottle of beer, which the rich do not pay simply because they have a lower marginal value per rand. Um, so regressive tax is, is, is an issue for the poor, and the poor have less access to outlets and facilities. They have to travel further. So for example, in the townships, and those of you in here that you know, suppose there are some who support the DA, let me remind you that the DA was very proud of going into, for example, Longa Township and shutting down Shabins and liquor outlets. Uh, and said that they have to comply with the law that applies in historically white areas, which is you have to have a business license and business zoning. The whole point about apartheid and black areas is there is no zoning and there are no town planning schemes. So technically speaking, lawfully, you cannot have lawful business of any kind in, an area, in a, in a so-called township or location or settlement. Uh, they are forbidden by law objectively. All of them have to be illegal. And so by shutting them down, you are forcing people to walk immense distances or travel in taxis, immense distances to get their products. The ones being shut down have been liquor, but in fact, technically speaking, every other outlet should also be lawfully shut down for precisely the same reason, the absence of zoning and business licensing and other things like building standards regulations and so on. <coughs> so the poor have less access and they are by far the bigger victims of these many state measures. Um, and they have more unhealthy habits. Rich people tend to have healthier lifestyle habits. They tend to, for example, have fresher vegetables. They tend to get fresher food. They tend not to rely, for example, on as much salt to, to stop food going off and, and overcook the food and thereby destroy nutrients. And so the poor in every way are worse off. And overcooking also increases carcinogens, for example, depending on all sorts of issues, whether you're frying and so on. So the poor are the victims always and excessively. And uh, they are less informed by labels, warnings, etc. So all of the things we want, proper labeling and warnings, uh, uh, for the poor tend to be less accessible if they are not fully literate. Um, so what are legitimate consumer choices? Pleasure, satisfaction, happiness. They are entitled to their own convictions. If you think prayer will cure you, so be it. You don't have to go and see a doctor. You shouldn't be forced to see a doctor. And you don't need to have surgery or medication, or you can have complementary in terms of medicines if you wish. These are consumer rights. You might regard them as irrational. You might regard them as unscientific. You might regard them as imposing extra burdens on the state healthcare system. Uh, but uh, if, you want to, if you want to regulate consumer lifestyle and health choices, then you should make, for example, prayer illegal because the scientific evidence doesn't show that prayer increases recovery rates. So you should ban praying for sick people if you, if you really believe in the sort of rhetoric that comes out of the, 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 the officialdom. And the World Health Organization, which I will get into. Um, Unhealthy lifestyles should be a choice. You should be allowed to be sedentary. For example, the World Health Organization said recently that the latest evidence on tobacco is it's worse than they realized. It turns out to be as bad as obesity. So if you're banning tobacco, why not ban obesity, you see? I mean, it is, it is a very, very high health risk. And, uh, or supposedly, my own view is these things are much more complicated and it's, and it's not monocausal and it's not any one of these things like obesity, for example, sedentary lifestyle that causes health risks, but that's another complicated statistical uh, regression analysis. 
then there's the question of junk food. The consumers are entitled to junk food. They're entitled to sugar because they like it. It's lacquer. They enjoy it. And that is a huge value. And the fact that someone else thinks it's bad for you, which it may well be, as it happens, I personally have no sugar. I've given up sugar. I'm a terribly boring Puritan myself, by the way. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't have sugar. I don't have junk food. I eat vegetables. And I exercise regularly. And I'm a fitness fanatic and so on and so forth. But I will defend to the death the right, your right not to be like me. That is what a free society is about. Um, Okay, red meat, fatty foods, dairy products, all of these will have to come under the guillotine, carcinogenic forms of cooking, and refrigeration. Those of you who don't know, refrigeration is one of the great causes of ill health because refrigeration preserves the life of the food but does not harm the bacteria. So all it does is give harmful bacteria more time to germinate and contaminate the food, which is why, for example, you will get food poisoning from a restaurant but never from a street vendor. So the little old lady who is driven off the streets with horses, horses and reds, ants and dogs and clubs, who's selling boiled millies on the side of the road, her food will not give you food poisoning because she buys fresh millies every day, or meat or whatever it is that the informal sector sell. And the restaurants give you food poisoning because they have refrigeration and are obliged to have refrigeration. They must have refrigeration whether they like it or not. It's obligatory health law, which actually paradoxically promotes ill health. And, um, and so gambling, including entrepreneurship, is gambling. Investing on the stock exchange is gambling. And of course, going to you know, casinos is gambling. I also don't do that, by the way, but I will, you know, I, I find it much easier just to walk downstairs and stand at the rubbish bin and throw money in than to go all the way to a casino to do it. But other people want to do it in casinos. I mean, that is their, that is their choice, and I will stand by their right to do it. Um, and uh, subject to third-party protection, and alternative health care. I mean, it's interesting for me that I have the same objection to the regulation of health care, kinky sort of lefty, cutesy stuff, which I kind of like myself, alternative health care, vitamin supplements and, and homeopathic treatments and, and Reiki and all of this sort of thing, uh, that those people, if you realize that Leon Lowe lumps you along with the sellers of tobacco, it seems odd, but they're in the same boat together. And interestingly, I would love them all to realize that. They're all under the same attack, which is the nanny state telling consumers how to live their lives and what is and isn't healthy. And, um, and so legitimate limitations, I'm going to move on because I want to get some distance, but you all get a handout, this handout, and you can interrogate some of the points further if you wish. I think it's not legitimate to limit any of these issues. And, uh, and I want to get on to what might follow. Where is this going? It always fascinates me that it should be obvious to everyone where things are headed. I'm always amazed that people don't see it, that it's inevitable what's next in the pipeline. So the inevitable domino effects are it will have to, if you're going to ban and tax and sugar, then you have to ban and tax everything that the body metabolizes into sugar, which is carbohydrates. And so you will have to have health warnings on bread and cakes and biscuits and biscuit taxes and so on. Flour and wheat and dairy products, especially fatty ones, creamy ones, and rice and potatoes, carbs that metabolize into sugar. We should have, you know, potato tax, I think, and health warnings on rice. And uh, exercise uh, made compulsory as it, now, as it has been over many years and more recently became in North Korea in various communist countries and fascist countries. It was compulsory in Nazi Germany. So is that really what we want to emulate? And then sex. According to our own Department of Health, the biggest single killer in South Africa is HIV AIDS. So if you're going to regulate health at all, what you must start with is sex. That's the first one on your list, not all these other things that are peripheral comparatively. Uh, but you should make extramarital sex illegal. You should make, you know, I don't know, adultery forbidden. And you should certainly ban gay sex. And you should ban condomless sex and so on and so forth. Now, if you accept the principle that you may not smoke in your own drawing room if you're a designer, then you have no basis on which to object to a rule saying you must use condoms. You see, what's the principle? Where's the difference in principle? If you accept the one, then the other one naturally and automatically and inevitably must follow. And, uh, and, and that's certainly where things are headed. 
Sex, on the other hand, is a very important one. It is the one area where the right thing has been done. No regulation, lots of education and information. It has brought about fantastic lifestyle change in many countries. It has been about a precipitous tumble in HIV infections. It is the great success story of how to influence consumers. Is education and information, not regulation and control. That's the one everyone should learn from, is what has been done regarding sex. Um, then uh, values and ethics, and eventually Big Brother is just going to be unleashed into full-scale social engineering, uh, uh, determining people's values. Um, there are various anti-consumer proposals before us, and I'm not going to go into these in greater detail, but the demarcation regulations started with medical schemes. And we warned when medical schemes had all sorts of things like uniform rating, so-called social solidarity, where everyone pays the same rate, everyone gets the same benefits, and so on, this, this one size fits all. We warned that that would eventually have to go over onto insurance, which it has now done. Insurance is now subject to similar proposals in draft regulations. And I encourage everyone who's not familiar with them to make submissions and look at them from a consumer perspective and say, hold on a sec, this is a massive violation of the consumer's right to buy cover for what you can spend. You, you're entitled to go to a hospital and pay for yourself, or go to a doctor and pay for yourself, or your homeopathic uh, physician, or your traditional healer, or whatever. But you may not get insurance for it. Now, what's the logic? Is that you can't insure yourself against an expense you're entitled to incur. This is, this is how you know, bad the law has become. And, uh, and, you know, if you have social solidarity where everyone gets the same payment and the same benefit, then we should have the same for supermarkets. Everyone pays the same price regardless of what's in your trolley. Uh, or the same for cars. All cars cost the same price. We, won't, we need car solidarity, you see. All cars should cost the same price regardless of which car. That's how illogical it is to have so-called solidarity and uniformity with medical schemes, for example. It is it just applied to something else in life, and you can immediately see, frankly, that it's nuts. It's actually quite interesting that we get away with it in something like medical schemes, but when it would be quite obviously nuts elsewhere. So all sorts of anti other anti-consumer proposals are on the way uh, regarding uh, junk foods, age restrictions proposed, advertising and marketing bans under consideration, Cold drink sizes, they already been regulated in some countries. Sales to fat children, regulated in some countries. Can you imagine being a shopkeeper and five kids walk in and they each want to buy a bar one and you say to two of them, no, sorry, you're too fat, the other three can have bar ones. I mean, this is literally the law already in some places and is under consideration in South Africa, we are told. It's not yet been officially published. Uh, salt. This is actually literally regulating the flavor of your food. Now, if, if, if somebody else decides to make you healthy, you may not determine the flavor of your food. Well, you know, is this really what consumers should put up with, is the question. Is, is, this, is a, this, is a, this is not a, there's nothing to do with suppliers of salt. You must understand. We don't care here about the suppliers of salt. We care here about the rights of consumers of salt. And their rights are the issue that are under attack. It's not salt that's under attack. It's not suppliers of salt that's under attack. It's consumers of salt who are under attack. That's really got to always be clear. Just remember, nobody ever controls things. You know, we used to have in the old days the egg board and the dried bean board and the soya bean board and the has been board and whatever board. And I always used to say, have you ever seen anyone control an egg? The Egg Control Board never controlled any eggs. E eggs don't get out of control. All they did was control people. And all controls, <coughs> always remember, are controls of people. More specifically, of consumers. Suppliers are really unimportant in, in this whole exercise. I mean, they have rights, yes. They have freedom of speech. You know, freedom of the press. Let's just look at that. Is freedom, this is a media brief. Is freedom of the press about the right to say what you want, to publish what you want? Or is it the right of consumers, the right to know, the right to information? Freedom of the press is usually defended as the right to know. That's important. It's the right of consumers to have access to what people want to say. Important as the right to say what you want to say might be, the more important right is the right of consumers to be exposed to what you want to say. 
the right to decide which newspaper, which magazine, which radio station, which TV program. It's a consumer right that is important, not a supplier right. And so it is with all of the other things, salt, sugar, tobacco, and so on. Now, let's look at the interesting about healthcare costs. In my uh, presentation at the African Tax Forum in Arusha, uh, I went into the papers, and uh, it is assumed that unhealthy living, any form of unhealthy living, imposes costs on society. Well, just understand something. There's something undignified that I have to say. If unhealthy lifestyle means you die sooner, it means you save society money because there's less pensions, the highest health care costs by far in old age. So people who live unhealthy lifestyles subsidize healthy people. You must understand that unhealthy people subsidize healthy people simply because healthy people live longer and draw more social benefits in their old age. And if you could persuade all of the people to die younger, it would be a massive saving to social costs and the fiscus. The trouble is people are living too long and people are too healthy. We should encourage them to drink and smoke and become obese and have unsafe sex so they can get out of our hair faster. Um, not really. I don't mean that. Of course, I want people to live longer. But I'm just making the economic point. The argument that unhealthy lifestyle is a social cost is simply bad arithmetic. It's just wrong uh, in any way the calculation can be done. Very sophisticated econometric analysis has been done, for example, by our South African professor, Duncan Rieke. But, but, but it's even obvious before you do the statistical analysis. Um, so uh, anyway, if it were true, it's no excuse for regulating consumers. If, if you're going to have a social cost, it's no excuse for me taking away your freedom. Um, uh, free, that, that's the point of a free society, is that it is risky. And it's the thin edge of the wedge problem. So let's see, the, 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 I could go into it further, I do in the paper which any of you can have a copy of, with actual sources, citation of empirical sources. Uh, so it started with tobacco, then there was the salami technique, you slice off one little bit at a time, it starts with saying you have to protect third parties from passive smoke, absolutely agree, no compromise, I want full 100% protection from smokers. Okay? <laughs> then it goes on to the next thing which is warnings, and it goes on to limited sales, and it goes on to age restrictions, and it goes on to ad bans, and each little slice in and of itself doesn't seem too serious. Thin slices of salami don't seem to harm the salami, but eventually the salami is finished. And then you start the next salami, which is the next product, and so it goes, until eventually everything is subject to the same control. I'm going to not delve into tobacco any more than, than I want to. I've maybe even said too much about it already. And you've got this, this presentation is available to you as a handout, which any of you can take and, and get your own notes. But let me just discuss the World Health Organization. This is a very strange organization. In theory, it's meant to be there to do research and to pass information on to governments about health so they can formulate policy. Also by the salami technique, the World Health Organization has encroached further and further and further beyond its original mandate. And it now, basically, it's regarded as giving obligations. We Governments all over the world, in Africa and the Russia, they were talking about our World Health Organization obligations. And I said to them, you have no obligations. You have World Health Organization recommendations. And, uh, and it is an unelected bunch of bureaucrats with strong ideological perspectives who now recommend fiscal policy. They're recommending what taxes should be on sin, so-called. Uh, they're recommending regressive tax, in other words, effectively taxing the poor more. They're recommending budgetary policy, what the tax should be spent on. Now, this is the World Health Organization. These are people with no expertise, no qualifications. There's no reason to believe they should do this at all. They are far exceeding their mandate by recommending budgetary policy. They recommend criminal law and procedure amendments, which actually would be unconstitutional in South Africa. The way in which people should be prosecuted and convicted <coughs> for committing health sins, so-called. And they recommend far-reaching social, social engineering and behavior modification of the kind Nazis and communists uh, uh, popularized. And they recommend a rapid and substantial erosion of consumer rights. They have an extreme controlled society mentality 
and ideology. And it is not hidden, it is blatant, it is upfront, it is shameless. And uh, it is very, very dangerous because many governments assume that what the wealth or World Health Organization says is correct. It recommends the complete erosion of private property rights and the relabeling of private property as public property. So this, where we are right now, is 100% private, but according to the World, World Health Organization is in fact public. And uh, so it, our control over what we agree to in this room uh, has been usurped and, and its usurpation recommended by the World Health Organization. Concerns are one size fits all. They recommend one policy for all countries regardless of massive differences. Um, they compromise the separation of functions. In other words, health is now merged with fiscal and criminal and other policies. They, rec they legitimize discrimination blatantly against the poor. In particular, the poor are always the victim. And they legitimize authoritarianism. And they never mention, they know where, know where. I've searched the World Health Organization website uh, it's probably there, I didn't find it because there are thousands and thousands of documents, but I could find no reference to people's lifestyle, freedom of choice, consumer rights, property rights, freedom of association, civil liberties and due process. Um, so the economics of sin is that there's no such thing as a free lunch. Elasticity determines who is in fact taxed. I've covered that, so we'll move on. And uh, then there are unintended consequences. One of the unintended consequences is tax evasion and avoidance. If you raise the tax, for example, on salt to 500% or 5,000%, what do you predict? You don't have to be clever to predict a black market in salt. You don't have to predict smuggling of salt. You don't have to predict tax evasion of salt and so on. It doesn't matter what the product is, or as I say, the consumer, but the, the so-called, and I put un deliberately in quotes, because since these consequences are so obvious and so predictable, why are they called unintended? We should actually call all unintended consequences, Davi, never use the word again, they're intended consequences. <laughs> the consequence of a minimum wage is unemployment. It is an intended consequence, and so on and so forth. So uh, economists are very generous about people who have bad policies by saying that the consequences were unintended. They're not. They're intended. They know. You, there's no excuse for them. Everyone knows they're going to be what comes. Um, so you can take all the flack for economists in general. Your profession is to blame for, for making it look as if intended consequences were innocent. They're not. They're deliberate and intended. So when you banned liquor in the United States, and we banned liquor in South Africa for blacks until 1960, we had liquor prohibition, the Shabins, the bootleggers, the Scorpion, the Barberton, uh, the crime associated with liquor, the arrival of crime syndicates in America and South Africa were intended consequences. They were inevitable consequences. And that, I believe, was said by M Minister Motswaledi this morning that by 2040 tobacco will be banned. You have to accept that the consequence is intended. Crime syndicates, smuggling, black markets, ghastly consequences, the mafia, the same as we had with black liquor prohibition in South Africa up to 1960, a very ugly, horrible, nasty world. Um, and then blacks could buy liquor only out of government outlets and so on. And, and so uh, so we've victimized the vulnerable and I'm going to really uh, finish over here to give Tommy some time and you can see there's a lot more in the handout which you can look at uh, and I would like to just close with saying that there are various constitutional issues, the constitutional violations of various powers that are taking place, in my view, in all the health regulations. The way forward is lots more cooperation, not burying our heads in the sand and not just following the crowd, but actually being willing to look in the other direction at the truth and reality. And so with that, let me say thanks for your attention.